Hey everybody, and welcome once again to Nose in the Book, a Bible reading commentary with me, your host, Pastor Justin Van Reed. Great to have you with me once again as we take a look at four more chapters from God's Word. We have before us today Exodus 38, Proverbs chapter 14, and in the New Testament, John 17 and Philippians chapter 1. All right, as we turn back to Exodus here, once again, we are only a few chapters away from the end of this book, and much of the second half of this book has been taken up with the instructions for the tabernacle and now the building of the tabernacle itself and all the various pieces. So here we are in Exodus 38, and the tent has been complete, and the interior furniture has been complete, and now we are going to build the um the items that are going to be in the courtyard and then with the court curtain that's going to form the courtyard itself. And so here we have, first of all, the um, the altar for offerings, the altar of burnt offering. This is where the sacrifices are going to be burned up on the uh, on this altar here. Again, this is located not inside the tabernacle. Obviously, you're going to have this, you know, a fire here. So you're going to, this is going to be outside in the courtyard area. And um, and just like with uh, the other items, it's made of wood and then it's overlaid. In this case, the altar is overlaid with uh, with bronze. So lots of bronze here. And then there's various utensils for uh, the, you know, all the different uh, role here of the of the altar, how you're actually going to um, use it. So you need all these various pieces. And then after that, you have the uh, the wash basin or later in the temple is going to be called the sea. Um, and so this was uh, filled with uh, filled with water here, and again overlay with bronze. Then you have the courtyard itself, and so you have these curtains on the various sides, uh, 150 feet long, um, and you know so big, big curtains, and there and there's these poles, and you know just as the instructions were previously given, uh, so now we have the actual building of them, and so you're lots and lots of materials here. And, uh, and so this is actually where uh, Exodus 38 goes after giving the instruction here on the altar for offerings, on the wash basin, on the courtyard itself. Then we have this, this record here of the offering, all of the materials that were brought in. And we're talking loads and loads of stuff here, right? Um, gold, totaling 2,193 pounds. Think about how much gold that is, 2,000 pounds of gold. Then you have... 7,000 pounds of silver. Uh, just just an incredible amount here of, of gold, of silver. You have um, uh, all of these other items here. Um, 5,000 pounds of bronze. Uh, and then, you know, on top of it, you know, you have a number of other items that are listed here. Um, you know, the blue, purple, scarlet thread for the cloth and everything like that. But the focus here is just on the gold, silver, and bronze. Just in incredible, incredible amount that the people gave here, um, and then also including the uh, the tabernacle tax, the shekel, the sanctuary tax. All right, so that's Exodus 38. We've built the last pieces here for the uh, for the tabernacle, um, and then we have Proverbs chapter 14. And so here in Proverbs 14, just a number of various proverbs again. Let me uh, just pick out a few that kind of jumped out at me. I'm sure there's going to be, you know, every day there's going to be different Proverbs that are going to jump out at you for whatever reason. Something just speaks to you or, you know, there's a topic, you know, maybe something that you're going through. But uh, a few on the different topics that jumped out at me and just because of the wording also was kind of uh, catchy. Uh, in Proverbs 14, verse 4, Without oxen, a stable stays clean, but you need a strong ox for a large harvest. So th think about that. Right, this is what the, the proverbs require us to do: stop, and think, and have to contemplate. What does that mean? What is he getting at? All right. So, without oxen, a stable stays clean. So, you could have no oxen, you know, to and have so therefore have no uh, harvest. Right, have nothing that's going to work your farm. But hey, you'll have a you'll have a nice clean stable. You know, and so I could just picture this applying in, in a number of different ways, um, you know, as far as, you know, everything can be real neat and tidy and nothing going on, but then nothing could be accomplished as well. And uh, and so, you know, how about this one? Verse 9, uh, fools make fun of guilt, but the godly acknowledge it and seek reconciliation. So, you know, that, that you have this feeling of guilt, 
And rather than suppressing that, you know, full say, I don't care. And what do the godly do? They recognize, oh, this is wrong. And so they seek to correct it. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. There's a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. You know, this goes back to uh, the opening chapters of the book, and those different paths. And again, how enticing the one path might look. And so you might look at it and think like, all right, this looks safe, this looks good, but remember that it leads to death. And so this is where the wisdom comes in here, right? In discerning, not just based on what something looks like, feels like, it's not based on emotion, right? But I want to base everything on a truth and evaluation here of what's really right, not just what feels right. I want to be super careful about that, right? So there's a path that seems right, but it ends in death. All right, and then right after that, last one here, verse 13, laughter can conceal a heavy heart, but when the laughter ends, the grief remains. You know how true that is that, you know, when we're when we're grieving, you know, we, we, we might still laugh, we might act like, you know, everything is okay. And, you know, we're, we're so good at acting like everything is okay and hiding what's really going on in our hearts. The proverb here points out that, you know, that when that ends, nothing has changed on the inside. The, and the hurt remains. And, uh, you know, a lot of times we might just try and cover over that or ignore that. Kind of goes back here to even the the conviction, um, you know, that, that, that we see here in, uh, in, you know, in verse 9, uh, not listening to guilt, um, you know, not, you know, just pushing whatever those feelings are inside of pushing that away and not wanting to deal with that, not wanting to think about that. Um, you know, and so, so many people do this in so many different ways. And, um, and, and here he says, uh, the, uh, that, uh, when the laughter ends, the grief remains, it's good for us to, uh, uh, to evaluate the heart, to get into well, what's, what's really going on here. Nothing wrong with laughing. Of course, that's good. It's good, you know, for the soul, but, uh, but let it not be a cover up for what's really going on in the heart. All right. John chapter 17, New Testament. This is the uh, prayer of Jesus. He prays here for his followers. And that's the bulk of this prayer here is actually he's praying to the Father for his followers. He's praying, Father, protect them from the attacks of the evil one. In essence, he's really praying, Father, confirm my words. I have told them these things. I have given them what you have told me to give them. All right, Lord, I've told them this is going to happen. This is how it's going to be. Now, Lord, you you do what you said. Lord, I, I passed on what you gave to me. And so now, Lord, make it so. Make it happen. Uh, he prays here, not, and this is probably the, the, the most incredible part of this chapter, of this prayer here, not only for those who, you know, he walked the earth with. He says, I am praying not only for these disciples, not only for these 11 here, minus Ju- the 12 minus Judas, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Which means, John 17, when Jesus prayed, he didn't just pray for Peter, John, Andrew, James, the other disciples. He prayed for all followers of Jesus through all time. And what did he pray? Right after that, it's verse 20. Verse 21, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. He prayed for unity. Unity. And, you know, this, we have to be careful, right? Because this isn't unity of the whole world. This isn't unity of all who even claim to be believers in Christ. We recognize there's a lot of claims out there. But people who genuinely belong to Jesus, uh, who genuinely know him and uh, are seeking to obey him and are broken over their sin, are, are humble at heart, that we are all one, all one, and, and working you know together. Right? Think about Corinthians and how it talks about the unity of the body and how the body hurts when it's divided and how important this is. All right, last thing here, Philippians chapter 1, starting a new uh, book here from Paul, having finished Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians 1, four chapters here in Philippians. Uh, chapter 1, he starts off with thanksgiving and prayers, a very positive letter. He's very encouraged by the Philippians, and he starts off here. He prays for them. He thanks God for them. He recognizes that they have trusted the Lord. They're, uh, they're partners in, in spreading the gospel now with him. Uh, he, you know, This is a famous verse, verse 6. He's certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. What a wonderful promise to know that... Uh, you know, when God starts this work and us saves us, that he will bring it to fullness, to completion. Uh, he talks about how they've helped um, spread the gospel 
and you know prays that they would then continue to grow. He says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more. So he says, very positive view of the Philippians, says, I'm praying for you. I love you. Um, you know, you, you're doing great, and I'm praying that it would continue and grow and flourish. All right, last part of this, though, uh, this, you know, great live as citizens of heaven section here that, that Paul brings out. Um, you know, he, he he wants us to understand this world's not our home. He understands the world's not his home. He says, you know, I, I've seen the gospel preached and, you know, I'm suffering for it, but that's great for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. And so whatever God has for me, whatever God's plan for me is, I'm going to preach Christ. I'm going to be focused on Christ. And may it be so of us, uh, the followers of Jesus as well, just as Jesus prayed for us. And so again, um, four chapters here, Exodus 38 and the building of those various uh, courtyard pieces, uh, the Proverbs 14, just a number of different things there. Um, John chapter 17, Jesus' prayer for his followers in Philippians chapter 1, the opening of this letter as Paul um, is confident in the Lord's work. Uh, among the Philippians and praise that it will grow and the gospel will continue to spread. All right, that's all we have time for today. Thanks for being with me. Until next time, keep your eyes on the Lord and your nose in the book.